So each of these different environments are examples of a community of practice. The notion of a community of practice comes out of the work of Lave and Wenger, who looked at work groups, not necessarily research groups, but work groups in general, who share a passion or goal for something they do. They're working together and ideally learning how to do it better as they interact regularly. A community of practice is typically characterized by a shared interest, common domain, or direction. Within each of these communities, there are competencies, which can come in the form of techniques, beliefs, ways of communicating, carrying your life, like as a scientist. However, your community consciously or unconsciously defies competent. How to become competent and how to display competence comes from interacting and learning from each other. This is nothing unique to science. This is how work communities tend to operate across all domains. Shared practices can be unique to each work group, but there may be some commonalities across the groups. But again, they can be very different, even between two communities of practice right next to each other, right next door. Techniques and practices come in the form of methods, tools, shared history, and ways of doing things, the practices of that group. Within a community of practice, the goal is to feel like you're a member. Being a member of a community of practice requires legitimacy. If you're not seen as legitimate, you can be marginalized. Marginalization means you may be physically there, but you really are not seen as a legitimate or a real member of the community. This is particularly critical for newcomers, for someone who is just coming into a new group. How do they fit in? How do they display these elements of competence that other members are going to be looking for? This can feel like being judged and having to prove yourself. This complex working relationships are how we as humans operate in social and work environments. Here's where you may run into some issues. Different rules may apply to different types of group members, so not all group members are automatically equal. In well-functioning, accepting groups they are, but in others they may not be. These practices and these competencies can draw on and reflect the power structure of the group. Every group may have a different power structure, and they often also reflect wider societal variables, such as race, ethnicity, class, gender, all the variables that define us as individuals. So what does this mean for the science community? If you think about it, science really operates in many ways as a community of practice system. Think of the layers of communities of practice. For example, biomedical sciences as a whole is a large community of practice with lots of different disciplines and subdisciplines, which again can operate as separate communities of practice. Each PhD program or each research group is going to operate somewhat differently as a unique community of practice. Even peer review groups, grant review groups, manuscript review and journals all have unique ways of operating as communities. It's easy to see how these can be challenging for newcomers to figure out how each one works and striving to be seen as a legitimate new member of each of these different communities. Community of practice rules, such as work habits or social expectations, are often invisible and inconsistent from one research group to another. Differences in practices and differences in how each person is seen most of the time are not malicious or even conscious. These are just the unconscious ways that people in a group operate and can lead to bias and unintended assumptions. Occasionally, there are conscious efforts to exclude individuals, which can create a toxic environment. So think about lab rotations, your first couple of years in a PhD program, or a new postdoc group. Each of these settings and situations have unique risks for marginalization. But there are strategies to lessen the chance of marginalization for newcomers, both for the newcomers and established members. For example, if you're involved in establishing that community, the ideas of being open to and making group practices visible to new members of the group is critical. You can initially match talent to projects so people can feel like they can demonstrate the competencies before they stretch out into new areas. As a newcomer, there are many ways to obtain insider knowledge or guidance, a lot of which comes from mentoring coaching, and even seeking out colleagues who have recently transitioned into your new career stage or group.